under control. So the three Bible readings for today are ones where Jesus says stuff that we would expect the opposite of. It's in the Old Testament section, even though that's, in this case, it's a section from the book of Jeremiah, 700 years before Jesus' birth, then Jesus himself in the gospel section, and then in the section from the letters in the New Testament, we're going to see the same sort of thing. If we don't understand how these opposite things of what we expect are still true, even though they don't rank with the Bible in our heads, you know, unfortunately, we've all got this syndrome where we are our own Bible, then we need God's help. And that's what we're going to get in today's Bible sections. Let's take a look at the first one for today. It's from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter six. And the map shows you uh, fairly detailed uh, locations for all kinds of cities in Galilee County, where Jesus grew up, where Jesus did most of his work. He didn't do it down in the South County, the most populous count, county, the capital city county. He did it way up in the boondocks in Galilee County. The stuff he did and the stuff he said. You see cities up on the top middle like Chorazin, Capernaum, Bethsaida. Jesus said one time, if the miracles that I did in your cities would have happened in Old Testament non-Jewish places where there was nothing but heathen people, they would have become believers. So... Jesus wants to warn the people he spent the most time with up in Galilee County about what's wrong and what's the remedy. Take a look. We're starting in verse 17. Jesus came down from the hills with his students. He stood on a flat level place. Huge numbers of people who were learning from him were there, as well as a lot of other folks. They were from Judea County. They came all the way up to Galilee County. From the greater Jerusalem area, and even from the west coast cities of Tyre and Sidon, in the modern-day country of Lebanon. They wanted to hear his explanations of the Old Testament. They had diseases and needed him to heal them. He even cured people who had evil angels tormenting them. Everyone there was trying to touch Jesus because his power was coming out of him and healing them all. Jesus looked around at the people who'd come to learn from him. He said, it's really a blessing from God when people are poor. God's kingdom belongs to them. It's really a blessing from God when people are hungry. They're going to get all they can eat. It's really a blessing from God when people are crying. They're going to be laughing. It's really a blessing from God when people hate you, avoid you, say nasty things about you, and say you are evil because of your connection to the Son of Man. When that happens, be glad. Do a happy dance. You've got a great reward in heaven. That's how your ancestors, the Jewish people's ancestors, treated messengers God sent. It's going to be very terrible for you who think you're rich. What you have now is all you're ever going to get. It's going to be very terrible for you people who are full now. They're going to go hungry. 
it's going to be very terrible for you people who laugh now. They're going to be sad and crying. It's going to be very terrible for you when everyone says nice things about you. That's how your ancestors talked about prophets, in quotation marks, who put words in God's mouth. So it's important to remember here that what Jesus isn't saying when he talked to people is the things that it's natural for us to think. If somebody had a really bad life, then it's easy for us to think God's going to cut them some slack. For sure somebody like that's going to heaven. If people die in tragic accidents, a lot of times people will think, well, for sure these people are going to heaven. That's never the way Jesus thinks. He tells us stuff that's the opposite of what it's natural for humans to believe. Because humans, like we said before, it's natural for them to make themselves their own Bible. So Jesus is saying, when people think they've got it together, surprise, it's not going to be as good as we or they think. He's directing us to himself as the only hope anybody ever has. Then over to the Old Testament. The book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament has the same sort of talk as Jesus just gave. So Jeremiah 17 gives the flip side, just like Jesus talked about a positive and a negative. This is what Yahweh says. God's curse is on people who turn away from me and put their trust in human strength and how mortal humans can save them. He says, those people are under God's curse in this life and the afterlife. They will dry up like a bush in salty desert soil. There, Nothing is able to grow except tumbleweeds. It's a real blessing from Yahweh. When people depend on him, Yahweh will show that you can trust him. They will be like trees growing next to a stream. The roots of these trees reach down to the water. Those trees aren't afraid when hot weather comes. Their leaves always stay green. They won't worry when no rain comes. They keep producing fruit. So here again, it's going to be the opposite of what comes naturally to our heads. But God's always reminded us that's why we got to turn off the Bible in our heads and listen to the Bible from God's mouth in print in the book, or we're going to get ourselves in big trouble. And that leads us to the last of today's Bible sections. And this is a, just a paragraph or so from the letters that God breathed into Many had Jesus pick and then train. So this is the missionary Paul, or as he used to be known, Saul. He's a Jewish rabbi, so he has just about the whole Old Testament Bible memorized. And he really believed that his devotion to the Old Testament Bible and his own serious religiousness was going to pull him through. And then God got to him with the news about Jesus. Jesus himself made an appearance to him, changed Saul's whole outlook, and he became a Christian. We know him as Paul, and here he gives us some pretty personal information about himself and how he's not 
making it because he's got it all together. Take a look. To keep me from getting a big head about how amazingly Jesus trained me from heaven. God gave me the gift of a very painful recurring problem. Satan's messenger repeatedly beats on me physically to keep me from getting too proud. Now, the older translations call this a thorn in my flesh. A messenger, he says, to explain it more, a messenger of Satan that keeps on beating me. Verse 8. Three times I begged the Lord to make this suffering go away. But he told me, my love no one deserves is all you need. My power works best when someone is weak. So I'm very happy to brag about how weak I am. Then I have to depend on Messiah's power. Yes, I'm glad to be weak, take abuse, have hard times, opposition, and lots of struggles for Messiah because I am strong when I am weak. This is what sometimes we call a paradox, which is a statement of fact that sounds the opposite of what is logical. I am strong when I am weak. Doesn't make a bit of sense. And in our minds, the way our sin urges and instincts go, it's never true. Just think for a second, especially when we were younger. You know, when we were in upper grade school and we could see changes taking place in our bodies and our appearances, how many times didn't we think, if I could change this one thing about my appearance, then everything would be a lot better. I'd be more like other people. And everything would be better for me. People would like me more. It would just be good. Why do I have to have this one area of my life where things are not the way I want them to be? Paul, the missionary, <clears throat> and he hints at it in this, the beginning of this Bible section. He says, to keep me from getting a big head about how amazingly Jesus trained me from heaven, God gave me this gift, this thorn in the flesh. He's talking about not when he first became a believer. There Jesus made an appearance to him from heaven, and it worked. God did get to him, and for the first time he saw things properly. It was the opposite of what he used to understand and the opposite of what he expected. But this time he's talking about what he describes as happening 14 years earlier when Jesus trained him once he was a Christian, trained him to be an apostle. He gave him the same training that the other 11 apostles, you know, he got a minus Judas out. He got the same training that the other 11 apostles got, but he got it, he explains in the verses right before. That's where the context kind of comes in handy. We're looking, starting at verse 7. But if you look at the beginning of the chapter, you'll see him explain how God took him to heaven. And that's where he got the training the other apostles got. And so he could legitimately call himself 
an apostle, someone that Jesus had picked, and then, and then someone who Jesus had trained to know the exact same things as the other apostles. Now, getting your training from Jesus in Galilee County is one thing. Getting your training from Jesus in heaven because God took you to that place. And Paul says, you would not believe the stuff I saw there. I can't even put into words the stuff I saw there. That is a completely different thing. And Paul says, this is the reason why I got to deal with a physical problem. And it's not just something inconvenient. He says, it's painful. Why would God give me this? That doesn't make any sense. You think if you want the missionary to be the most effective the conduit uh, for God's word, reaching people, then why in the world would he make it difficult? Would people think that Paul was great because he's the only one, the only human that we know of who got to go to heaven and get personalized training in the Bible from God himself, from Jesus, in fact. If that happened, then people weren't going to pay attention to anything Paul said about Jesus because they'd be thinking, wow, this Paul guy, this is amazing. And they'd focus on him instead of what was really important. You know, the other problem is, what if Paul falls for thinking, you know, I must be really something if God allowed me to have this incredible experience. And if that happens, then Paul's going to depend on who he is and what he's done. And he's not going to depend on the news about Jesus. And then this is him sealing his own doom for all time. And God didn't want that. God didn't want Paul going to hell. And so he said, I'm going to let this really bad thing happen to you. Paul calls it a thorn. And he calls it a thorn in his flesh. And that means pain. So it's some sort of painful thing. People have come up with all kinds of guesses about what this was. Some people think it was, you know, recurring uh, convulsions or seizures that he would have. He'd be sitting with a group of people explaining the Bible to them, and all of a sudden he would drop to the floor with uncontrollable seizures, foaming at the mouth and scaring the people to death. It's going to be really tough to get people to focus on what you're saying when you have that sort of thing happen. If it's a migraine headache, which is what other experts think, that's also, you know, it debilitates you. There's almost no way you can concentrate on what you're supposed to be saying when you have one of these things. Other people think it was malaria, that he had gotten it, you know, in his work down by the ocean coast, and that he had to deal with it, that his hands shook. Some people think it was something to do with his eyesight, that he couldn't see very well. And this is also a big disability when it comes to working with people. And this is something that he had to live with for the rest of his life. He tells us in this section, verse eight, you see that? Three times I begged the Lord to make this suffering go away. But then verse nine says, basically, God said no. And so for the rest of his time in this life, Paul had whatever this physical suffering was. And people would have just said, no, this is a setback that really makes you ineffective as one of God's workers. But he says here, no, no, that's not the reason. God did, did this, allowed Satan to do this to me to keep me from getting too proud. It was like a life-saving measure. If this wouldn't have happened, if God wouldn't have let him go through these really painful times, then he wouldn't have stayed depending on 
the news about what Jesus did in his place as well as everyone else's place, and that would have been dead man walking. This is a really important concept in the Bible. No cross, no Christian. You know, Jesus wouldn't be the savior if his life didn't end on that cross. He wouldn't have rescued anyone. And in the same way, the Bible explains to us over and over, and we'll, we'll in the next three or four months, we'll be looking at some of these experiences where Jesus explained to us, and we see examples from Christian lives, Christian lives from the Bible, that they all had to deal with these kind of, you know, debilitating pain, suffering, setbacks, they were miserable. But that if you don't have these things, you're not going to stay Christian. The people, the book of Hebrews says, that God loves, he disciplines. And that means pain. That means misery, problems, setbacks. The pain and the setbacks are from God. You know, we, I know it says in this verse 7 that it was Satan's messenger, but it was God who gave permission to Satan to let whatever the physical uh, suffering that Paul had to go through in his life take place. We can understand if it's Satan, but we don't understand if Satan got permission from God, if ultimately it was because God wanted those things to happen that they happened. We, we don't like thinking this way. That turns God from our friend to our enemy, someone who doesn't have our best interests at heart. We don't want to go there. This is natural for our sinful side to think the urges and instincts that we were born with are going to say if god loves me he'll have everything go my way and i won't have any trouble if he really cared about me then he would do that thing that the blessing at the end of church time says that the lord is blessing you and he's always protecting you if he lets pain and setbacks happen that's hardly protecting me but the Bible says that God needs to help us to depend on him. And the way he does that is through pain and setbacks. That doesn't seem very considerate to us, but this is what God's truth is from the Bible. So God might appear or seem to be the enemy. Just a couple quick examples. Remember in the Old Testament uh, book of Genesis, the first Bible book, uh, chapter 22, where God, te God tells Abraham to go take his son on a three-day road trip and then to cut his throat and burn his son's body up. His only son kept repeating this all the time. Your only son, the son that you love. Now, that does not seem to be something that a friend would do. And then remember Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob had uh, an experience where he thought his brother was going to kill him the next day. And he shipped his whole family in teams uh, away to what he hoped was going to be safety. And then there God met him and wrestled with him. And God dislocated Jacob's hip. And the rest of Jacob's life, he had to walk around with a dislocated hip, which has to be very painful. Does God seem to be our friend when he lets this kind of craziness happen? Or is he appear more to be our enemy? You know, even think about um, the Old Testament book of Joshua, where we learn about Samuel, his mother Hannah couldn't have any children. And God blessed her finally with giving her a son. She said, I'll, if you give me a child, I'll give him to you. And so she sent Samuel 
uh, a way to school with the head priest to be one of God's workers at the temple. That, again, that does not seem like you're doing people a favor when you even take the gift of children away from you. So the, here's the problem. In our lives too, bad stuff that happens does not make it appear like God is on our side. But what we have to remember all the time is that the one we can trust the most is not me and what things feel like to me because what I specialize in is getting it wrong. And God specializes in getting it right all the time. If he lets it happen, he's in control and he guarantees it is going to end up being a blessing. Here in Invergrove Heights, not far away from church, over on the other side of Highway 52, in the last week, they've been collecting snow from all over the place, and they dump it on an empty lot on the other side of the Missouri Synod Church. And there is piles of snow there. Lots of municipalities do this. I mean, you can have literally a mountain of snow that the city relocates just to make getting around convenient for people. You want to think kind of. This is the way, this is what my thinking unconsciously has been doing for me. It's been mounding up mountains of sin, my own sin that I'm not even aware of. It seems to me like I'm making complete sense, but in God's record book, it's going down as sin. When bad things happen to me and I blame God and I say, God's a fool. If he was really smart, he wouldn't let this happen to me. I, I, I've told him, just like it says here, Paul said three times, I begged the Lord to make this suffering go away. I told him, I'll be a much more effective missionary if I don't have these seizures or migraines or whatever in the world it was, which makes perfect sense. But it's technically a sin calling God out and saying he's the dumb one and I'm the smart one. This is no good. And this is why we depend on the cross that Jesus wore, right? It, it didn't seem as though God was on his side or that this was making sense on the day he was executed, carrying his own cross and then on the cross suffering an invisible to humans damnation sentence the Bible had to document for us in writing in its pages. But if Jesus doesn't wear a cross, you and I don't have any hope. No matter how stupid that seems to people, it's the only way. So God chose to show me love. You know, it wasn't just a feeling with God. He always shows how he feels about us. And in this case, he shows me love by letting bad things happen to me, even though the things that I contribute to my relationship with him are nothing but sin, nothing but sin. This demonstration of his love even goes to things we don't consider demonstrations of love. He knew all the reasons I'd give him not to love me. He still continues to show his love, which is the opposite of what everyone deserves, in what we would describe as surprising, possibly disappointing ways. He finds disappointing ways that we figure aren't going to work to keep us depending on him. These are things we call our crosses that he wants us to carry. The only thing in life I can count on positively. I mean, there's a lot of things I can count on negatively. I'm going to keep on sinning. But the thing I can count on positively is God's going to keep giving me the opposite of what I deserve. And he's going to keep on counting Jesus' life in my place. And so he doesn't have anything against me. 
my thinking always, because I discount everything the Bible says on my own Bible, right? So I'm going to think if God lets bad things happen to me, it's because he's got to punish me for the wrong stuff I've done. So then I just discounted all the news the Bible says about Jesus. I have to have a talk with myself all the time and tell myself, stop that. That is not correct. The Bible puts in writing that he's loving me all the time, even though it does not seem possible when there's all of these kind of disappointments and setbacks that every Christian has to deal with. There is never a moment when God isn't hard at work inside you and around you. And he's doing what he promised to do, which is keeping us close to him and not letting us do what we favor the most, which is getting away from him, turning our backs on him, disregarding what he says and disregarding his word. Our inability to recognize him at work in our lives. Doesn't mean a thing. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean that he isn't keeping his word. He has not given up on us. He is not punishing us, giving us a preview of what we deserve. Even these bad things that happen in our lives are valuable blessings. If we try to fix our lives ourselves, we're opposing him. And this is not a good thing. In Paul's case, that's what happened, right? Take a look at verse 9 again. When I begged him three times, God, to take this suffering away, Paul says, he told me, my love no one deserves is all you need. My power works best when someone's weak. If I don't try to fix my problems myself, I won't be weak. And I won't need what the Bible says Jesus did in my place. I go, well, I think I'll still keep it together. Well, the Bible says that's not true. My power works best when someone's weak. So I'm happy to brag about how weak I am. I have to depend on Messiah's power. Yes, I'm glad to be weak, take abuse, have hard times, opposition, lots of struggles for Messiah, because I'm strong when I'm weak. So God's the only one that's going to be able to keep me close to him. And he uses his word to pull me back, tug me, drag me the opposite direction I want to go, which is back to him. Let's go to prayer. Father, I am grateful. Not very often. But at this moment, I'm grateful because your word has got to me and showed me things about life and about myself I'm not that proud of. How often I have opposed what you send, even what you are, what you did in my place, and how I figured I have the master plan. We're thankful that Jesus took responsibility for my mounting pile of sins that I will just keep manufacturing like a factory until you take me out of this life, that you've got all that covered in my place. Thank you for being the friend of sinners and giving me so much proof that everything is safe with me, not because of anything I do, but because of what Jesus did in my place. Help me share this while I still have time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself to you. It comes courtesy of Jesus' life in our place and his damnation, death on the cross. The Lord is blessing you all the time and protecting you constantly too, regardless of the way it feels. The Lord is making his face smile on you, and he is being gracious to you, the opposite of what we all deserve. The Lord is paying attention to you, and he is constantly giving you his peace. 
And so that is that for this week. God's blessings on the next seven days. Thank you, Pastor.